Good evening. Welcome to First Baptist Church this evening. And this is a really good crowd on a Wednesday night where there's no spring where there's no school because of spring break and no Awana club because there's no school because of spring break. Uh, hopefully that means some people that are normally uh, serving in Awana get to come in and uh, be served tonight uh, by the preaching. Our preacher is back from his vacation. Uh, he doesn't look or sound any more British than when he left, but uh, I'm sure there's plenty of stories, so uh, I'm sure we'll hear a little bit later. Right now, let's sing Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Go ahead and stand, and let's start our service. <clears throat> Wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since jesus came into my heart i have ceased from my wandering and going astray since jesus came into my heart and my sins which were many are all washed away since jesus came into my heart since since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know, since Jesus came into my heart. I am happy, so happy as onward I go, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Good evening. It's good to be back. It's a lot warmer here than there. I don't think I was outside without a coat the entire couple weeks we were there. The sun shone on three days. One of those days, the wind chill was like 20 degrees or 27 degrees. And the folks from England said, you picked a really good week. The weather's been wonderful. Not for a guy from Florida. Got a couple of folks for you to give you updates on. Dreama Hager is at South Shore Hospital. She's been moved to a regular room now, and she's doing a lot better. Belly Betty Ballard is home, and so that's great. We've got a couple missionaries in Haiti. I'm sure you, if you watch the news, Haiti's in turmoil. Their president was assassinated a year or two ago. The prime minister has fled. Gangs are in control of about 80% of that country, and they have been releasing the prisons. Uh, I, I read 4,000 prisoners have been uh, released, probably gang members. They may have just opened the prisons up altogether. Uh, we've got two missionaries that we support in Haiti. Uh, both have been in the country. Uh, Benji Dryden has been in the country since beginning of 2024, and he attempted last week to, to get out and could not. They were, he was able to get out of the country on Tuesday. And he is now home in Florida. Uh, Joel DeSour, who was kidnapped a year ago, uh, is also back and forth. He's been using missionary aviation fellowship planes to fly back and forth using small runways in the country. And uh, I don't know if he's staying there much, but he's coming back and forth between Haiti and Miami. Uh, that man is fearless and just fearless. We need to pray for Haiti, for Joel DeSour, for Benji Dryden, for Dream Hager, and also for Betty Ballard. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to be here tonight. We're thankful that you have protected both Joel DeSour and Benji Dryden. We pray that that protection for Joel would continue. We pray for that nation. 
And Lord, we just ask though for the Marines, the U.S. Marines who are being sent there, a thousand of them, I believe. I pray for their safety as well. We ask that you continue blessing Dreama. We pray you, you would comfort her, strengthen her. And we pray the same for Betty. We ask you, Lord, that you would uh, encourage her as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Brother Jim's going to come with the missionary update. You can have a seat. Donnie and Phyllis Weeks. Donnie and I actually grew up together. Now, Donnie's about four or five years older. So Donnie's the guy that you admired when you were in junior high and all those things. He was the high schooler and he was ornery. <laughs> he was. You, we, had, we got together one time. We were telling stories. And I thought, that was you? <laughs> But uh, Donnie pastored for many, many years and actually was pastoring down at a church that I used to minister at in Sarasota, and God called him to the mission field, and he has been in a couple, three different places. He is now semi-retired, but still active, and so he's, he's still communicating with the folks that he has ministered to over the years, and that's kind of what his letter is about, and then there's a very special prayer request at the end. It feels like we have left a piece of our hearts in every place we've ministered over the years. We often think of those we've led to Christ and those we've trained. Facebook Messenger helps us keep in touch as we reminisce and laugh, listen to their problems, encourage and offer advice. It is the joy of the ministry to hear that our children, meaning his spiritual children, walk in truth. Josh, who we wrote about in our last update, has struggled with being in church regularly since then. But when he does come, he always tells us, that's just what I needed. Yes, Josh, every week is that way. Just what you need. Just what we all need. One Sunday morning, Josh came into church looking very shook up. He had lost another army comrade to suicide. This year... I've lost three of my buddies that served in Afghanistan. I've lost them all to suicide, he told them. Uh, our hearts ache for him, but we were also thankful that he heard the gospel and received Christ that day in September instead of taking his life. If you remember whether or not you do or not, Josh was a young man and, and uh, Phyllis and, and Donnie are working in, in Missouri uh, where, where his family is from uh, and... Uh, they're still ministering in a church, and he met this young man and won him to Christ, and the man was considering taking his own life until he met Christ. But he's had three of his army buddies commit suicide, as you just heard me say. Uh, uh, Donnie goes on to say, This has been a reminder for us of hurting and even desperate veterans in our communities. We're praying for believers to reach out to those men and women, to befriend them, and to share Christ with them. We praise the Lord for Pastor Remish and Suchi as they work with a deaf church in Bangalore. Ryan, their son, is also involved, and he recently won a contest of giving the books of the Bible in sign language from memory. He also plays the guitar for the church services. We are so proud of him that an 11-year-old wants to serve the Lord. He's 11. Can you imagine that? Wow. They then give us a very important prayer request, and we're going to close the letter with this. It says, please pray. Don had his first MRI. I'm sorry. Please pray for Don as his first MRI showed bone growth inside of his cervical spine. We are awaiting the results of a second contrast MRI to see if the spinal fluid is able to move through there, through there freely. His nerve... His neurosurgeon is highly regarded as one of the best for which we are thankful. So Donnie's having some uh, serious health issues. We need to remember that as that uh, spinal column seems to be closing in on itself. Uh, they then close out by saying, may God bless your labors for him this year. May your church reach more souls as the day of the Lord draws near. May he bless your family with peace. Don and Phyllis Weeks. Long time, not long time missionaries, but faithful missionaries, faithful missionaries. And we appreciate their service to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do appreciate the weeks. God, even as they have come home off the field for reasons uh, that uh, we may not know about, but God, you directed them to this church there in the, in the Missouri area. And Lord, you've used them to win many to Christ. And even this young man named uh, 
Ryan or Josh as he was just about ready to take his life. Lord, he's really struggling the fact that some of his army buddies have seen no way to, to stay here on this earth and have committed suicide, taken their own life. I pray now that you would just give uh, Don wisdom as he deals with Josh and may Josh be able to minister to his other army buddies. We thank you for the faithfulness of these two. We pray that you continue to use them mightily. We love you, God, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So I often observe that when we sing, more people walk in the door. It, it happens more than you think. So let's sing some more. We've already had some more people come in since we first stood up and sang. Let's sing some more and let's see if some more people come and join us. He lifted me. Let's sing one more time. In loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. From the depths of sin and shame, through grace he lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me, with tender hand he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh praise his name, he lifted me. He called me long before I heard, before my sinful heart was stirred. But when I took him at his word, forgive me, lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me, with tender hand he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh praise his name, he lifted me. Now on a higher plane I dwell, and with my soul I know tis well. Yet how or why, I cannot tell, he should have lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me, with tender hand he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh praise his name, he lifted me. Thanks for singing along tonight. Go ahead and have a moment of fellowship. Greet each other with a handshake and a smile.
Okay, as you finish up your fellowship time, you can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, Dave Albertson is here, and uh, the song he practiced, we had to make a last-minute change. So all that means is he's going to come back again another time and do the song he was practicing for tonight. Meanwhile, we're going to do a different song uh, that's going to suit the circumstance a little better. So uh, be kind to us. Uh, very short little practice session. Uh, we're going we're gonna to play until then. Robert, you check that and make sure that ACs are running on 71. It seems to be colder than that. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2 in just a little bit, and then John chapter 3. My wife and I got back from England on Monday night. We had a day delay leaving. We were at the Orlando airport, uh, checked in. We're waiting to be called to the flight. It's about 5.30, and a dog uh, hit, bomb-sniffing dog hit on a piece of luggage in Terminal B, which shut everything down. Our plane finally left around 9.40, but our the plane we were supposed to catch in Atlanta left at 9.30. For, <laughs> so it was obvious we were not going to make it. So we spent an extra day there and arrived on Wednesday. Uh, England is very different. We were at a place, we were at Stonehenge. They think it's 4,000 B.C. Uh, we were in... London saw the Tower Bridge and the Tower Jail, uh, Westminster Abbey saw Big Ben. Uh, we were also at 
the Roman Bath, the city of Bath, which was a Roman village from 3 A.D., I think it is, uh, 300 A.D., and then um, it couldn't be that, it had to be 300, 300 B.C., but anyway, we also saw uh, see, it was like Stonehenge, London, o- Oxford. Josh lives about uh, 40 miles from Oxford. It takes well over an hour to get there driving, and Oxford was our favorite place. Uh, it was really, really unique, really nice. Uh, I asked someone from Great Britain in military who has also been to America, and he said, America and England are different in this. Americans think that 100 years is a long time. British folks think that 100 miles is a long distance. And there is no agreement about this between the two countries. 100 miles in Great Britain was a long way because the roads are narrow and they have no shoulders and there's not a straight road in that place. And I was in churches that were founded in 1080, the church founded in 10, uh, 1210. It was just very fascinating. London is a beautiful place. The architecture in London, both the new and the old, are just beautiful. And I wouldn't want to live there. I missed Florida. I missed you folks. I'm going to begin a series this evening and over the next uh, number of weeks. Did God say that? What does God's word really say? Remember the game when people get together, it's called rumors, and one person tells a story, and that next person tells a story, the same story, and they tell it down the line, and by the time it goes all the way around the circle of folks, if you've got even five or six, but eight or ten, by the time it ends, the story has changed so much, it's hardly recognizable. There are things when it comes to understanding the Bible that this has happened to. We've heard someone talk, We've picked it up. We've repeated it. The greatest issue in understanding the Bible is knowing what the Bible actually says. Since the Bible is the word of God, what we're about to deal with is really what did God say? Did God say that actually, or is it a bad interpretation? The problem can be intentional and purposeful to make folks confused about what God has said. In the very beginning of the scripture, Genesis chapter 3, Satan, using a serpent, questioned the word of God with Adam and Eve. Yea, hath God said? What did he say? The problem can be accidental. There are people that don't know any better. They've heard from someone else. They've heard from an expert or a preacher, and they pick it up and they repeat it. By the way, I believe that this is a problem of preachers as well. Preachers hear a famous preacher. He says something. We pick up on it and we repeat it. And we don't check it out because we trust the man so much that we kind of think, well, that guy wouldn't make a mistake. I had someone tell me one time, but you and Dr. So-and-so disagree. And I don't care. Because I'm not looking to Dr. So-and-so for my learning. I'm looking to the Word of God for what I learn. And I don't I don't trust anybody on telling me what to believe. I trust the word of God, and I have the Holy Spirit as my teacher. So those folks can help me, but they can also hurt me. So what does the Bible say? Now, there's a number of ways to study the principles of interpreting the Bible. Number one, interpretation must be based on the author's intention of the meeting and not the reader. The, The Bible tells us that God is the author, and he used human men. What did God say using these men? It's not, what does the Bible mean to me? The issue is, what does the Bible mean by what it says? You might think of it this way. When God, the Holy Spirit, had that man write the Bible, what did that man think was being said? Number two, interpretation must be done in the context of the passage. If you take the Word of God out of context, you can make it say literally anything you want it to say. We have a missionary, nice guy. He's written a couple books. The first time I read one of his books, it was about the book of Proverbs, and he had taken every scripture verse in that book out of context. And I wrote him a letter. I said, I would love to help you. What, what your book says is right, it's good, but you need to get proper context when you bring a scripture verse in there. And I said, I'd be glad to help you. He was offended. 
been 20 years. He's still offended. Number three, interpret the Bible literally or normally, allowing for use of figurative language. In other words, if the plain sense of Scripture, you need, it makes sense, don't seek any other sense. And if the Bible uses the word as or like, it's talking figuratively. But if the Scripture doesn't say like as or like, take it as just, this is what it means. Number four, use the Bible to interpret itself. A difficult passage in the Bible can be made clearer and understandable by understanding a clear passage and making a correlation to it. It's called the law of non-contradiction. The Scripture does not contradict itself. So in a difficult passage, if it seems to be a problem, it's not a problem. The problem is you don't understand. Another great help in that is the law of first mention. If you want to understand what something looks like, you read the early portions of the Bible, and the first time something is mentioned, it sets the standard for what that is going to be all the way through Scripture. So the law of first mention and the law of non-contradiction. Non-contradiction. Number five principle. Interpretation should be distinguished from application. Interpretation is this is what it means. Application is this is how it might apply to you. Now, interpretation is going to be the same throughout time, but application can be different in different cultures because we understand things differently. Number six, we need to be sensitive to distinguish to distinctions between Israel and the church. There are some who believe that the church and Israel are the same. They're not. There are some that believe that the church has replaced Israel. It has not. When the scripture speaks of Israel, it means Israel. When the scripture speaks of the church, it means the church. Also, we need to understand there are distinctions between the old covenant and the new covenant, both in eras and in requirements. How about this? Number six, be sensitive to distinctions. I got that one. Number seven, be sensitive to the type of literature you're in. The Bible contains a great number of different types of literature. There's law. There's narrative, there's wisdom, there's poetry, there's parable, there's epistle, which is a letter, and there's apocalyptic or apocalypse, which is future. Each of these types of literature has specific features that should be considered when you're interpreting a text because it can make a a big difference in how you apply it and interpret it. Now, you use in those seven, and by the way, there's a number of different ways to say, give me principles of Bible interpretation. I thought this was, these seven were pretty com, uh, complete, but it shows you it is complicated. There are things you, when you study the Bible, who's this written to? When was this written? What would the people who first read this have thought when they see things? The goal in teaching and interpreting and applying the scripture is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It is this passage, this principle, that this brief study series will be based upon, rightly dividing the word of truth. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible mean by what it says? Sometimes that is very obvious and very easy. Other times... It might be a little more challenging. The goal in interpretation of the Bible is to answer the question that Pilate asked Jesus. What is truth? And Jesus answered it, thy word is truth. Our foundation for this series is really Romans chapter 3 and verse 4. Let God be true and every man a liar. If someone disagrees with the word of God, that's their problem. We're not going to join them. Well, I've had people say, but that's not what Baptists believe. I don't know what every Baptist believe. I do know that not every Baptist behaves the same. And I also know that your belief affects your behavior. So if we don't all behave the same, we must not all believe the same. And once again, I don't answer to other Baptists I answer to my Savior, my Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, I'm very comfortable if someone doesn't believe like me. I'm comfortable if you don't behave like me because I'm not going to answer for you. Well, if you're a member of this church, I will to a point. 
But you're going to answer to God for your behavior and your belief. So, misconceptions and errors. Have you ever heard someone say, you must know the day or date that you were saved or you're not saved? There's other ways to say that, and I'll give you another way a little bit later on. The factual truth is that there are some people who know the date and date, even the time that they were saved. And there are some people who do not know the day or date or time that they were saved. And it really doesn't make any difference. In modern life, we know the day, date, sometimes even the time when we were born. It's on a birth certificate. It's a legal document that's required when a child is born. Now, in modern America, we are brilliant in some things. We're not brilliant in other things. The last four years or so, we're now questioning, and medical doctors are questioning, is it a boy or is it a girl? You can't tell by what you see. Don't let your eyes lie to you. It might be a boy. Well, it might be a boy for a while, but then it might change. There are doctors in this area that have been taken up on this stuff. You need to find out what your doctor does. My wife and I, because of a change of insurance, had to change our doctor. We went to a doctor in Sun City Center, female doctor, lady doctor. We got an application she asked questions like, what, what are your preferred pronouns? What do you identify as? Male, female, male identifying as female, female identifying as male. We called up the doctor and said, is this, is this serious? You as my doctor are going to let me pretend to be a woman if I say I'm a woman? What if I walk into the doctor's office and say, you know, my right ovaries really bother me, doc. She said, well, we'd have to have a conversation about that. No, there's no conversation about it. The, the, the conversation about it, I will refer you to a psychologist. You need to get there as soon as possible. Shame on us. By the way, if we don't stop our medical professionals from doing this, they will continue because they're getting pressure from above. Demand that your doctor does the things you want. If you're young, uh, age that uh, you can have children, you need to find out if your doctor will perform abortions or even refer for abortions because if they will and they do, they've got a moral issue that may affect you sometime. I would say do not have any doctor treating you that does not honor life, even unborn life. We need physicians that agree with the Word of God and with us. I want to give you some examples of people who know the date and time that they got saved. And the first and most obvious one is the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 9, the story of his life is told. He is a Christ-hating, Christian-hating man who tortures people and gets them to deny Jesus Christ. He is enemy number one of Christianity in the first century. He met Christ as an adult on the way to Damascus. Outside of that city, the Lord confronted him, blinded him, put him on his rear end on the ground, and said, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? And he knew exactly who it was. Saul knew it was Jesus. Now, if you're Saul, do you think you would remember the date and time that you met Jesus Christ? How could you forget it? I know folks who were saved as an adult at a very significant event who know exactly when they were saved. I have friends that were saved in a Billy Graham revival. 
They know where the revival was. They know what year it was. They know what time it was. They know what day they got saved. I know people who were saved soon after a traumatic event. I've led people to Christ in hospitals after an accident. I've led people to Christ after an arrest. I've led people to Christ after a funeral. Some years ago, I led two young men to Christ at their dad's burial. It was snowing in East Tennessee, and after the burial, they came to me. I'd given the gospel, and they said, we need to know. We knelt down in the snow beside their daddy's casket. They accepted Christ as Savior. You think they'll remember that? Some people might know the day and date they got saved because someone suggested that the day and date is so important that you need to write this down. Matter of fact, there are many people who accept Christ as Savior, and the person who led them to Christ says, you need to write this down in the front cover of your Bible, that on this date, you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. When I was a teenager, we would get on the bus, and we'd sing songs. One of the songs we used to sing was, it was on a Sunday that somebody lifted me. It was on a Monday that somebody lifted me, going all through it. And when the day that you got saved took place, you stood up. Uh, do you know that the people who were saved on Sunday, although there were a lot more of them, were no more saved than the people who got saved on Monday? By the way, the more, the people, more people got saved on Sunday and Wednesday and Thursday night than any other day. You know why? Sunday night, Sunday church, Wednesday church. Most churches had their visitation programs on Thursday night. Over the years, I noticed it was just it seemed to be a pattern. One time we were singing that song, and some kid said, I don't know when I got saved. I don't know what day it was. He, he got saved one night beside his bed when he asked his parents about it, and his parents led him to Christ. Now, his parents may have known the date, but he didn't remember. Our youth director said, pick Friday. This Fine, just pick any date. It didn't really matter. Now, before we get too much farther, we need to understand that false doctrine and bad instruction can cause confusion. We started out with 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. To rightly divide the word of truth is to recognize that salvation is a result of God's work and it's God's gift given to us in response to faith. I have met folks who, when I ask them if they, I used to ask this question, I don't ask it anymore because it's problematic. When I ask them, when did you receive Christ as Savior? They would say, let me get my baptismal certificate and I'll tell you. Now, it is possible that someone got saved and baptized on the same day, but it's also probable that they didn't. I am not against baptismal certificates. I think they, they can be used for wonderful things. Matter of fact, Baptismal certificates used to be used as an indicator of birth because churches would give baptismal certificates for infants who were baptized, and that became the birthday because the child was usually baptized in the church the first time it went to church, and so that became the recognized day of birth for some. Infant baptism is a form of doctrinal error it's based upon baptismal regeneration. Baptismal regeneration is the belief that it is the baptism that puts you in heaven. It's the baptism that saves you. Often it's belief and baptism are required for salvation. I've heard some say, well, it's belief to get you there, but baptism that seals it. Once you get into false doctrine, you can make up anything you want to make up as justification. Baptismal regeneration is taught by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Seventh-day Adventists, by Latter-day Saints, also called the Mormons, United Pentecostals, other churches that call themselves Oneness, Churches of Christ, Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, Western Orthodox, Russian, Greek, Coptic, all of them. Now, the problem with infant baptism is that they're telling parents that because we baptized your child, sprinkle a little water on them, if they die, they go to heaven. Now, I, 
I believe something a little different than that. I, I believe that little children, when they die, go to heaven. If they're not old enough to understand about sin and about the gospel, we've had little children in our church who were born with severe handicaps. I think a girl named Shannon, age of my oldest daughter, about 43 years old, she's, she's severely cerebral palsy. She's never spoken. We have no idea how much she knows. One day her mother came to me and she said, what, when Shannon dies, where is she going to go? My, I, thought, I said, I believe she goes to heaven. Well, she can't believe. If she can't believe, then God, being gracious and merciful, would take her to heaven. To, to me, it's the only answer that fits the nature and the holiness of God. They don't need infant baptism. That's ba based upon baptismal regeneration. By the way, infant baptism, Catholic, Orthodox, Anglicans, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Methodists, some, not all, Nazarenes, some. I've never met a Nazarene, but I've read that some Nazarene churches do infant baptism. I, I tend to not believe it. Moravians, United Protestants. How can that many religious denominations have the doctrine of salvation that wrong? Because they started listening to men rather than the word of God. And like the game rumors, this one says it. This one heard it. They repeat it close. Another one hears it, repeat it close. Another one hears it, repeat it close. And by the time it gets down here, it's changed so badly that it's not even the same story. That's what's happened in a lot of churches concerning eternal life. The most important thing we deal with. Now, if Satan can take churches that our job is to be presenting the gospel so folks go to heaven, and he can take the number one message that we have and turn it to where dozen denominations, major denominations in the nation, no longer believe in salvation by grace, through faith, without works, what else can they convince people of? And the answer, as far as I'm concerned, is just about anything they want to convince you of. How about some examples of people who might not know the day or date of their salvation? My granddad Rumsey was born in Kentucky, rural Kentucky, western Kentucky. I think it was, it's either 1894 or 1896, because I can't remember. He had no birth certificate. It was Kentucky in the 1890s. Talking to my granddad was really fascinating to me. He said to me one time, I remember the first time I saw a car. He said, I can remember the first time I saw a plane. My granddad was alive before radio, before television. He died before the internet. Died, I think, 91 years old, so he, in, the, in the 1980s. I asked my granddad about it. I, I was a preteen, and I was concerned about how come he did not know when he was born. How do you know when your birthday is? If no one wrote it down, how do you get a birthday? For a 9 or 10-year-old kid, that was a big deal. Because birthday was the second best day of the year. Christmas is the best day of the year. Birthday's the second for an obvious reason. He looked at me like I was a dumb kid, which I was. And he said, I don't need to know when I was born. I know that I was born. What they, I asked him about it. He said what they did was they just chose a date. Somebody realized he may have been four or five years old. When's my birthday? And they went, hmm. And they just made a date up. So every year on a date that was not my granddad's birthday, we celebrated my granddad's birthday. You know, Jesus said, you must be born again. He did not say, you must know when you were born again. The important part is not that you know when you were born, but that you know. 
I once heard a preacher declare that it was important to know the date of your salvation. After all, he declared, you were there. I started thinking that through. Well, I was present at my physical birth, but I don't remember any of it. I was there. But my mother, my dad, told me that I was born on May 25th. What if they were lying to me? What difference would it make? The only difference would be I might not know my exact age by a few days. Who cares? It doesn't really matter. You know, so I look a little older than what I am or I look a little younger than what I am. It doesn't matter. I don't know the date that I accepted the Lord. I do know that I was five years old or six years old. I do know it was a Sunday evening after church. Our auditorium was about twice as long as this and about the size of the, this building with the beams come down. Didn't have these outside things. And I was sitting about where Chip and Jenny are. And that evening, I just got up and came down forward. And Mr. Brophy or Mr. Roller, who were the, the two men who did the when people came forward, they would pray with them, led me to Christ, told me about it. I'm five years old. I don't know hardly any theology. I had not been a wicked sinner. I didn't repent of anything, nothing to repent of. My mother would not let me sin. She was so legalistic. Worst thing I had done in my life that I remembered was my kindergarten teacher told us to be careful in the wagon and not mark the floors. And I got in the wagon and turned it too sharp and it put marks on the floor and I got in trouble. And in my five-year-old mind, I, that was the worst thing I'd ever done. I guess I could repent of marking the floors in the kindergarten room. But I know what I did. I trusted in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I think it was a week or two before Thanksgiving because that was about the time that it got cold in Pueblo, Colorado. It, September, October, were, 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 they were not warm, but it got cold in November. And I remember going into the car after church that night, and the car was cold. No one wrote the date down for me. They didn't say, hey, let's write this in your Bible. So I know the day I was born physically because someone wrote the date down and told me. But I'm alive. I don't know the exact date that I accepted Christ as my Savior, but I know I accepted Christ as my Savior and I have faith in him. I'm spiritually alive. I am as certain of my spiritual life as I am of my physical life. And I don't need to know the date. I know the fact. In 2003, I interviewed a lot of prospective Christian school teachers. And I interviewed one, and I said to her, when did you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? And she said, I really don't know how to answer that question. I can't remember when I first accepted Christ, but I trust Jesus as my Savior. My theology got rocked a little bit because I had been trained all of my life to ask people when they accepted Christ as Savior. And so now I've got this issue that I'm having to deal with. Is this a problem? Should I not hire this woman because she can't tell me when she accepted Christ as Savior? Well, she gave me the right answer. The right answer is she was confident in the faith that she had in Jesus Christ. She was confident that her faith in Christ would take her to heaven. That's better than knowing a date. Because I know people who've known a date that changed the date. I'll tell you how later. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 7 to Nicodemus, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. John three fifteen, 
whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why would Jesus repeat this so many times right in a row? By the way, you want to lead someone to Christ and you say, I just don't know where to go. You don't need the Romans road. Go to John chapter 3. You've got everything you need in John chapter 3 to lead someone to Christ. Abundance of information there. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. What about a baptismal certificate? What about writing on the inside of your Bible? What about repenting of your sin? What about joining the church? Jesus said, it's faith. He that believeth. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 6, 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh unto me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. John 6, 40, this is the will of him that sent me, and everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 47, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. John eleven twenty five 25 and 26, Jesus said unto her, is it Martha or Mary? Anybody know? Chickens. I think it's Mary. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's spiritual life eternal. John chapter 20, verse 31. These things are written, speaking about the things that Jesus did and the miracles that he did, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. First John chapter 5 and verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I do not know the day that I got saved, but I know I got saved. Because I believe. I've, I never stopped believing. Now, there was a time I got 13 years old or so at youth camp. There are some preachers at youth camps, Bible camps. They are determined to get every kid saved. And if you've got to get resaved, they'll restamp you resaved. And they gave me some doubts. So one night on camp, I came forward, knelt down, and this was my prayer Dear God, if I'm not saved, save me now. And take away my doubts. And I've never doubted since. I didn't get rebaptized either. By the way, I didn't get baptized right after I got saved because I announced a couple weeks after I got saved that I could not wait to jump into that baptismal pool. And my mother said, You're not getting baptized till you grow up more. I was gonna dive. To me, it's almost as big as a pool. Is you're not going to embarrass me. I have a really strong suggestion for you, for myself. Focus on the fact of your faith, not on the memory of the day or the date. I'll give you four reasons and we quit. Number one, it is who we have faith in that saves us, not the date. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Second of all, when you give your testimony, when you got saved, the date is of little to no help. Really, knowing the date that you got saved benefits you and you alone. It might help you with your Belief, your trust. But I don't know, and I don't have any problem with it. I know I trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know I've been doing it for about five decades, six decades. Man, 
my life is getting away from me. <laughs> By the way, happy birthday to Brother Stitzel. See, you told me it's 73, was that? <laughs> I'm giving him... Yeah, I gave myself 10, I'll give you 10 too. He's 83 years old today. When you came to Christ is of no importance to anyone, and it's not necessarily important even to you. So says my grandpa. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me, let's suppose, since it's Dick's birthday, that we decide we're going to give him a gift. This is really something. <laughs> Dick, happy birthday. This is your gift. Yes. <laughs> Now that that is his, does it matter that I gave it to him today? Or if I given it to him tomorrow, would it still be his? Would it matter any? Well, it would help with his tears today because I I, his heart is so soft. He, he, he was touched by the sentiment of the gift. <laughs> Number three, there are people who thought they were saved on a day or day and then later discovered that they did not really know the Lord and had not really placed their trust in the Lord on the day or the date that they thought. It could be as a child they did not really understand or, or that they had been told that they were placed into salvation through infant baptism or through baptism as a teen or an adult or through church membership or by some religious observance or practice or by observing the Eucharist. Lord's Supper for the Catholics, they're teaching. I mean, if I heard a fellow over in England mention that, it, that's how you, you know you're saved is by receiving the Eucharist. Mm, not even close. But there are people who have been told this, and then they come to hear the gospel message. Or they read the Word of God, and now they become enlightened by the Word of God, and they understand that salvation is the gift of God and not a product of works. You don't do anything for it except receive it. Kind of like Dick just received that box of Kleenex. Did you notice I didn't tell him, you need to repent of all the sin that's been in your life up to this point or you can't have that box of Kleenex. You got to join this church or you can't have that box of Kleenex. You got to have the Lord's Supper. Or you you got to be baptized. Or you, yeah, he's giving it back. <laughs> when I handed him the box and he reached up and took the box, that's faith. He trusted me that I was going to give it to him. That's all that takes place. One last thing. Stressing a date can bring confusion, especially in children, but also in those who are unlearned in Scripture. As children mature, and as those who don't know the Scripture learn it, they will both be relieved to know that it is faith that matters, not a date. The issue is faith in Christ not a date on a page or on a calendar. The moment of salvation is not the issue. Knowing Christ as Savior is the issue. I've listened to parents arguing with their children concerning the date the child was saved. The girl, who was 11 or 12 years old, maybe 13 at the most, had returned from Bible camp, having trusted in her Savior at Bible camp, and was now proclaiming that she got saved at camp and wanted to be baptized. The parents were certain that their girl was already saved before she went to camp because they were there when she got saved. They heard what she prayed. The parents were certain that she was saved, but she was not certain when she was saved. So what do you do? Your child accepts Christ as a five, six, or seven-year-old, and then they come back five or ten years later and say, That's, that wasn't it. Don't argue with them. Say, praise God. It doesn't matter when. It matters that. The important issue is not the date of salvation, but the confidence we have in the faith of salvation. I know I'm saved 
because I know why I am saved. I am trusting in Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins and be my Savior, and I am saved. And I don't, nothing else matters. I was speaking two weeks ago, 10 days ago now on Sunday. Um, I think it was actually two weeks ago tomorrow when Josh was promoted, all of the folks in the chapel system in that area came to the promotion ceremony and I was just happened to be sitting across from an Anglican priest. And so we had a conversation and he said, uh, and I finally said, you know, none of this stuff matters to me. What matters to me most is that people know Jesus Christ as their Savior and that they are saved by the grace of God and nothing else. And I watched a man go. Anglican priest. I I don't know how much his education was. He was a man in his 50s. But sitting across that table from him, I realize this is a man who is not trusting in Jesus Christ as his Savior, and he's teaching others what he's been taught. He's not teaching the gospel. He's teaching rumors. Someone told him what he's to teach, and that's what he's doing. And it's gotten so far away from the scripture that no longer is salvation by grace through faith a part of his message. By the way, that my comment about the thing that I cared most about, I said, I, I'm not interested in all the side issues. I can have good fellowship with anyone who knows Jesus Christ as Savior and who is saved by faith. After I said, that was pretty much the exact words, within about two or three minutes, he got up and left and went somewhere else. He didn't want to engage on it. You know why you don't want to engage? Because you can't defend your position. You know why at your family meetings, you have you, family say, no religion, no talking religion, and no talking about politics. Because we don't have the ability to defend what we believe. It, it, it ought to be that we could talk about differences in politics and differences in religion, what beliefs, and not get angry at each other. Why not challenge each other? Why not have spirited debates? Because we're afraid. If you know that you are saved by Jesus Christ because of your faith in him, you will have more boldness to share it with others than if you just know a date. Heavenly Father, give us confidence. Help us to know that we are going to heaven when we die. Not based upon the good life that we're living or the good works that we do or the church that we're members of or a date on a piece of paper Help us to know because we believe in you. And we know what the word of God says. And we believe it. And we trust it to be true. Because we put our faith and trust in God the Father and in Jesus Christ. Give us boldness. Help us share. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Have a good week. Glad you came out.